Our first story for tonight is what you might call an exclusive, but not in a way we're happy to report. In truth, it's a story of great personal triumph, but even deeper personal tragedy. For that reason, Gary Craven opens with this personal note. Being a producer for Montage has taken me to a lot of different stories. Some happy stories, some very sad. The story you're about to see tonight is one of the hardest I've ever had to produce. It's a story of very personal triumph for two people, Dirk Fisher and his wife Angel. I spent three days and a night on their boat, the North Wind, at sea with them during the filming. Two days after we'd finished the filming, the North Wind capsized and sank at sea, taking Dirk and Angel with it. The story I present tonight, I think, is a story they would have wanted to see. The story is of sunken treasure, Spanish gold and silver and jewels, and golden pieces of eight like this one. It begins here on a cloudy Sunday morning four weeks ago at this tourist attraction called the Pirate Treasure Ship. We've been waiting three days for the rain to stop, and Sunday morning or not, we were there bright and early to make up for lost time. This model of a Spanish galleon, you see, is the working office of the largest treasure ship salvage operation in Florida, and probably the world. This morning we were going out on their supply boat to a site they had been working for two years. At that site, they hoped, a 17th century treasure ship, the Nuestra Senora de Atocha, or Atocha for short. As we sipped our coffee amongst the tourists, there came a sudden explosion of excitement from the office in the stern. Over the shortwave radio, the salvage ship at the site had reported finding five bronze cannon. Now we weren't the only ones going out to the site. Within minutes, we were packed with underwater survey gear, cameras, and five people from Treasure Salvers, Incorporated. Their excitement was understandable, as Duncan Matheson, the company's archaeologist on the right, explained. For five years, they had been looking for this wreck, and today, finding those cannon would prove they had it. Because of its location, be between the Marquesas Keys and the Dry Tortugas, and well out of sight of any land, the 1622 Spanish wreck has lay untouched for three and a half centuries. With no visible features from the surface, it's a wonder it was ever found at all. The boat on the scene was the North Wind, and it was obvious the crew was ready for the celebration we'd brought out to them. The North Wind is a steel harbor tug, converted for diving, and not the best accommodations at sea. But the diving crews were happy on their five-day shifts, and it was home for young Dirk Fisher, the captain, and the boss's son, and his wife of two years, Angela, or Angel as everyone called her. Dirk at the radio, Angel with the champagne. The whole Fisher family is involved in the company, and Dirk almost glowed with pride at being the one to discover the first cannon. It had been an accident, almost. The night before, the wind had come up, and they had dragged their anchor. First thing that morning, Dirk had gone down the 50 feet to search for the old spot, only to see five cannon half buried in the sand. Now it was our turn to examine the discovery. Duncan organized the team with fresh divers. At that depth, they would only make two 50-minute dives a day to avoid getting the bends. As we checked out our gear, Duncan gave his instructions. On a Spanish cannon, you record it on your slate as you already have them numbered, right? Then we'll go back and uh, measure them. Look around first, right? Look around a little bit, yeah. Then we'll go back and then look for inscriptions. And then we'll, uh, after that, we'll come up and sort of re regroup and then go down and do another, another run. Dependable scuba diving is really only about 20 years old. Before it, any work on the bottom was very difficult with the heavy helmet and pumped air technique. Now, heavy work is still hard underwater, but mobility is much greater. On the bottom at 25 feet is the Atosha's anchor. It has been carefully mapped and left as a reference point for locating other finds at the site. This careful mapping and recording, including some very sophisticated photographic techniques, has become very important in treasure recovery and to everyone's advantage. Commercial salvages, I think, have, have come to realize that it's, it's to their benefit to have an archaeologist uh, available to help them develop better methods of underwater mapping techniques so that they are able 
to know far more what artifacts they are getting from what areas. This helps them in planning their operations, and it, and it develops a, a more uh, systematic approach to uh, commercial salvage. When we came to the cannon on the bottom at 50 feet, they were as imposing as we thought they'd be. In this good condition, and with the information about the ship with them, they should be worth $20,000 apiece. The artifacts are worth more when an archaeologist can state exactly where the artifact came from. Without that, the, uh, the objects, no matter what they are, are not worth nearly as much as they are if the, uh, if the archaeologist can state where they come from. And photographer Glenn Kirkpatrick and I were back on deck when Duncan came up. How's it look, Duncan? Boy, it looks really nice. Those are beautiful cannons. They're going to provide us with an awful lot of new information, I tell you. It's magnificent down there. Five of them all laid out. Are they exposed? They're exposed. There's number four cannon needs to be excavated out. It's still underneath a little bit of sand overburden. Number one, two, and three are fairly well exposed. Four and five still need some work to be done so that we can fully expose them. They're really nice. more exposed than that when we first found them. They got buried. They got buried the boulders, again. Yeah. Well, what we have to do now is very carefully work out a system so we can un uncover that number four. For two years since the anchor was located, this group has been finding bits and pieces of the wreck. A few coins, muskets, a rare navigational instrument. But the cannon are the first large objects recovered. Angel had been out looking for more, where the bronze would have kept the grass from growing. And she found another area that looked like the same area we found the bronze without any grass growing or anything. Finding treasure isn't new for the Fisher family. It all started 11 years ago when Dirk's father, Mel Fisher, moved from California with his family. He had decided to spend one year without pay searching for treasure near Fort Pierce. Four days before he and his partner, Kip Wagner, would have given up, they struck it rich. At that time, newsman Joe Abril, montage executive producer today, was on the scene as they brought up the treasure. And they were all amazed at the find. Ring money, huh? That's How about that? This is 22. This is acorn, acorn seal. This is, this is pure ingot. I don't know how they could refine this. It's pure in the 17th century. Mel, now, what is all this stuff? Do uh, you have any idea what this is they just brought up? Well, 250 years ago, they didn't have $1,000 bills, so uh, uh, they'd use this for a $1,000 bill. That's uh, really a $1,000 coin, I guess you'd say. <laughs> but I imagine it'd be kind of heavy. They would not know until later that their find was to come to over $6 million, one of the largest finds in history. They had to work hard for two years and dredge up nine acres of ocean bottom to collect this. But in spite of the very hard work and long hours, you could tell the thrill of treasure hunting could get into your blood. And with one good find, it was there to stay. Everyone tells us there's a lot of gold and silver still out there and untouched. I guess uh, that's your main occupation now to find it. Yes, uh, I just uh, went over to Spain about a month ago and dug through the archives, and I was amazed. There's, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of galleons uh, filled with gold and silver, which are down in the ocean, and uh, just a matter of bringing it out. But it's, a, it's very difficult. Uh, the average diver uh, or uh, treasure hunter would never find any, I don't believe, because uh, the problems are tremendous. And it's Mel Fisher's operation today. He had flown down when he heard the news, and I asked him if this discovery would be as big as his find off Fort Pierce. This is going to be much, much larger. This is the big bonanza we've been looking for for 12 years now, and <clears throat> six years all out on this one particular ship. And uh, we've been finding it right along, dibs and dabs, but uh, it's, I imagine uh, it'll sell anywhere from... Uh, Oh, 100 million to 400 million, and that's quite a bit more than the one 10 years ago. Just 10 years ago, it had all worked out, and 100 million dollars this time. So, after filling up on Angel's cooking, it was a soft pillow to have all those dreams of Spanish treasure lying just 50 feet below your head. 
The divers worked hard all that next week, and even found four more cannon. But diving is only the final step in locating sunken treasure. It all begins very scientifically. Mel Fisher's 40-man operation has spent $2.7 million so far just in locating the Atocha. First, 1,700 documents were researched in the archives in Spain for clues. Aerial reconnaissance and photographs with special film then check out all the leads using the company's own seaplane. Finally, for this wreck, 120,000 miles of ocean bottom were searched with side-scanning sonar, magnetometer surveys, and a sub-bottom profiler. Since the wreck site was finally located two years ago, you can see the path of holes dug by the dive boats with a blast of water from their propellers shot down funnel tubes. This method is the opposite of the one used on Mel's first find, a vacuum cleaner technique. Blowing the sand away leaves heavy objects behind, and it can dig a hole 10 feet deep into the bottom and at depths up to 50 feet of water. After a hole is dug, divers go down to search the bottom for artifacts. The Atocha has listed on its manifest 3,500 ounces of gold, a large box of emeralds, and 47 tons of silver. That shouldn't be hard to find, but with the wreck scattered over about two miles, all the wood rotted away, and up to 10 feet of sediment accumulated, you can see the problems. Finding the cannons is a major help, because where those heavy objects lie, the rest of the cargo probably stayed. Most everything found so far is sealed up in vaults, but I had to ask Mel what a gold bar looked like. Well, I just happened to have one in my pocket here. Just I could slip. <laughs> when was that brought up? That's why I have to wear suspenders now. <laughs> Keep your gold We're up. finding so much gold that uh, 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 it makes my pants fall down. So. What is this now, exactly? Well, this was used, uh, oh, similar to a, like a $2,000 bill. 353 years ago. This ship sank 353 years ago. And, and these marks here show the uh, the tax seal uh, where the king got his 20% tax back then. Up until this month, another kind of tax was paid. 25% went to the state of Florida. The same was true 10 years ago. What do you think about giving the state 25% of everything you find? Well, uh, there's been 1,329 leases issued by the state of Florida, and uh, we were the first one of those 1,329 to ever actually give any treasure to the state. And uh, we did this of our own free will, and uh, we decided to uh, go by their rules all the way through, and we have. Uh, we have no objection to donating a substantial amount of the wreck that we're salvaging at this time to the state. Uh, for, for its archaeological significance in that it is a Spanish wreck of the 1622 period. But the state looks at the contract from the other side as paying the salvagers 75% for doing the state's work. Our law and Florida's policy as expressed by the legislature in the law is for the location, the acquisition, the protection, and the preservation of those sites which are indeed archaeologically and historically significant. This one has already proven to be such a site. He was telling me that the state of Florida was at this time in a position of, uh, of um, entering into a contract with the federal government into a two-party contract where the state would take over our rec site. What would that do to your interest in it then, your client's interest? Um, well, we would be completely at the mercy of the state on whether they would allow us to keep salvaging. And your, your present contract says that you'll keep how much of the salvage? 75%, and 25% goes to the state. So that we're talking about uh, them taking all of it instead of 25%? Well, uh, I don't think the state's in a position to do the salvage operation, because they would have to have appropriations from the legislature to do this type of salvage. Uh, whenever you get a bureaucracy salvaging instead of a private concern, you find out that the cost is exorbitant. I think that probably the state could spend as much salvaging as they would ultimately get. In March of this year, however, a Supreme Court ruling changed Florida's boundaries, putting the Atocha in federal waters. But Fisher's group still wants to work with the state, perhaps for the protection it would offer. And it seems now a solution will be found. But no matter who gets paid, the thrill of bringing those two cannon they had raised into Key West was the only thing that mattered that Friday. Finally, the critics were silent. 
Another treasure ship for Mel Fisher and his family, Dirk and Angel, triumphant at last. But our story can't end here. The next day, Dirk and Angel went back to sea. At 5.30 Sunday morning, just one week after their joyous find, their boat suddenly capsized and sank near the wreck site. Dirk and Angel never made it out of their cabin. A third diver also drowned. After three and a half centuries on the bottom, the Atocha had claimed three more lives. The Fisher family has paid for this treasure with a treasure of its own. <laughs>